the notion that an organic grower just lets the disease and the pests take over the farm, that is just not true. All right, everyone, welcome back to the show. So today we are talking about organic foods and organic production, right? And we want to know whether or not organic food is actually really healthier for you or if it is all just a myth. So we're talking about just facts today. My name is Dr. Mark and you are watching For The Record, the show where I explain some important stuff. Many here on social media, they taught organic as really healthy, healthier than conventional, and often conventional foods are even deemed as toxic, while organic foods are the healthy option. So the first question we want to ask is, are there any pesticides that are actually used in organic farming? And then the second question is, do we find pesticide residues also on organic produce? There are a lot of people claim that there are no pesticide residues on organic produce. We want to know, is that actually true? And then the third question we're going to ask is, is organic produce actually more nutrient dense compared to conventional produce, right? And then at the end, as always, we will let you know what does that actually mean for you. Pesticides have a pretty long crucial role in agriculture. And even before the chemical age, uh, a lot of crops were treated with what we would call today first generation pesticides. Those are like sulfurs and arsenic or copper, some other metals or nicotine. So in order to find better solutions that provide less toxicity to the plant, that provide more targeted options for the diseases, second generation pesticides were introduced some somewhere around World War II. Those included, among other things, also DDT, right? And now at the moment, further synthetic pesticides are introduced that are more targeted and less toxic to the environment, less toxic to humans. Over that time, Pesticide use globally increased by 20% just over the last decade. In some countries, low-income countries that just started using pesticides, it increased by 153% or more in a decade. Global agriculture is estimated to use around 3.5 million tons every year of pesticide. There is for sure a concern. And many studies have showed that multiple pesticide residues that can cause health risks. One of the reasons why organic uh, farming was developed was to reduce the risk uh, for farm workers and farmers and also for the environment. What does a farmer have to do to become organic? First and foremost, he has to ban the use of a whole range of synthetic pesticides and fertilizers. Organic farming excludes synthetic pesticides and most synthetic fertilizers from using in the farm. And then you have to farm your land also for three years without those products before you get the label. Thirdly, you have to get federal inspectors on your land. They have to certify your farm every year for you to get the label and also to keep the label of organic production. The thing is that a lot of people don't understand about organic farming is the organic label does not dictate what other production methods you can use. An organic strawberry farm, for example, does not look different than a conventional strawberry farm. They use the same production methods, like in strawberries, it's annual little plastic culture. What's different is the products that are being used to control pests and diseases and the products that are used to fertilize the strawberries. Most conventional farmers use a mix of synthetic pesticides and fertilizers and organic pesticides and fertilizers, like biocontrol agents for mites, for example, or manure as part of their plant fertilizer. Organic growers have typically less options, but they're facing the same diseases and pests. A lot of people think organic growers don't have any chemical options to control their pests and diseases, and that is not true. There are two really large options, chemical options, that organic growers can use. Those are copper-based products, copper-based pesticides, and they're sulfur-based pesticides. And then besides those chemical options, there are certain other ingredients like mustard oils, for example, that can be used as well. Beside those options, organic growers often resort to what we call biological controls. For example, bacteria and fungal solutions that are sprayed on the plant to fight off the disease or insects that are natural predators for pests. So, and then, of course, there are a lot of what we call cultural methods. So actually going in and removing diseased material from the farm, for example, which becomes a lot more important in organic farming, which then increases the labor cost. The notion that an organic grower just lets the disease and the pests take over the farm, that is just not true. Chemical pesticides, no matter if they're synthetic or if they're organic, as well as some of the bacteria and fungal biocontrol agents, they all leave residues on plant material, including the parts that we then eat. So this graph here that is widely spread on the internet, and it's wrong, right? Like this graph is wrong. Like this graph here would rather look like this. A good start of the conversation would be, Synthetic pesticides are allowed in conventional farming, as well as organic pesticides. Organic farming only can use organic pesticides and cannot use synthetic pesticides, but they still rely on chemical, biocontrol, and cultural methods to control pests and diseases. That would be a good start of a conversation. Organic farming on a commercial scale is always an economical decision, and it's not possible everywhere and with every crop. And I think that is something that a lot of people misunderstand. What about pesticide residues? So we already established that copper and sulfur products are off, often like the backbone of an organic farming program. Copper and sulfur products, as well as most synthetic products, can be harmful to humans, right? And I want to say something here. First and foremost, we need to think about the farm workers and the farmers, because those are the ones 
who handle those pesticides every day, right? Those are the ones that are being exposed to most to potentially harmful pesticides. And those are the ones also, by the way, that are now chased off the farms and kidnapped off the farms by our inhumane, corrupt, and evil government. And I'm going to do this in every video, guys. You know, if you want to support any of those actions, then you are siding with Nazis. Nazi ain't got no humanity. There are multiple deaths every year due to pesticide misuse on a farm. That's happening, right? But the question remains for us, like as a consumer, does the constant exposure of microdoses of pesticide residue on the produce that we consume has an impact on our overall health? That's a key question. Look at this graph here. There you see incidences when residues were found that were above the recommended concentrations on a whole range of produce. And you see the blue graph are organic produce. What we see is that organic produce are a lot less often contaminated with pesticide residues, but they're not free because organic farms are also using pesticides. So the question becomes then, how do you reduce the pesticide residues on your fruit and vegetable surfaces? So there has been a ton of studies done on that because it's a really important question. If you look at this graph, for example, it was shown that with simple washing your produce, I think this was done on tomatoes, it can reduce many of the pesticide residue levels significantly, right? So in this study, they have washed the tomatoes with three different detergents, and it looks that just water itself helps immensely to wash off a lot of the pesticides that are on the surface of your tomatoes. And there was a really good review article on this that came out last year in 2024, and you will find the link to this in the read of the week in the description of this video. Basically, there's a growing knowledge that points out to one thing. The constant exposure of higher residue levels of pesticides on produce can lead to a range of health issues. And that is especially true for children and elderly people. And the science on this is still very spotty. But let's take organophosphates, for example. That's an insecticide. So chronic exposure of high rates of organophosphates have been linked to neurological diseases, cognitive effects, Alzheimer's, and Parkinson's. Again, chronic exposure of high rates. The same is true for fungicides. Some, not all fungicides, but some fun fungicides are harmful for humans. And similar st studies have been found for some herbicides. So what is clear in science is that a constant and high exposure of those pesticides have severe health implications. And again, please think about the farm workers and the farmers first. What is not clear is if the ingestion of low dosages has the same effect. That's an open field of discovery at this point of time. So if you want to avoid pesticide exposure altogether, washing your produce is probably the best way to do it. Buying organic produce might help to reduce the likelihood of getting pesticides, but it's not zero. So now, what's about nutrient density? A lot of people claim that organic produce is more nutrient dense. And what they often do is they cherry pick studies, or sometimes even make studies up that don't even exist. And then they also often claim that organic food can starve cancer, while conventional produced food will make you sick. That's an excellent example of how food fear is created. So if you take anything away from this video today, then this. Fruit and vegetables are extremely healthy, no matter how they are produced. You should wash your produce, no matter if they're organic or conventional, and you should freaking eat it. You should eat five portions of fruit and vegetables every day. Let's take strawberries as an example. Again, this is the average nutrient density of a strawberry. So it's healthy. It's packed with vitamin C. It has low glycemic index. It's a great food even for diabetic people. So science is clear on one thing. The variety of a crop, you know, let's say a gala apple and a fuji apple those are two different varieties makes the most important impact on the nutrient density and nutrient availability again let's look at strawberries like elagic acid a lot of folks on social media say organic roasted strawberries have higher elagic acid content and therefore are starving cancer right you know maybe but you know what makes the much larger impact on the content of elagic acid the variety look at this table here those are different strawberry varieties look at the differences in elagic acid between those strawberry varieties nutrient density of any other fruit is mostly dictated by the variety and not by the management system. A few years back, a really incredible study came out that systematically reviewed all the studies that have been looking into nutrient density of fruit and vegetables that have been grown organically versus conventionally. And the results of this were extremely mixed. Look at this graph. So you see that some of the studies showed more nutrient density, some of them showed less nutrient density than conventional, right? Some of them showed similar or no difference. So it really isn't clear whether or not the production system has really a significant impact on nutrient density. Organic food is not always nutrient richer than conventional produced food. So now, what does it mean for you? So, first of all, it means do not panic. You really have to see this in the bigger context. In human history, it's the first time that there are more people overnourished than undernourished. All that comes with a whole set of new problems like obesity, food deserts, food waste, and of course, the heavily reliance on pesticides. Should you be concerned about pesticide residues on your food? Yes, you should. But you also should know that you can reduce your pesticide residues by simply washing your food, no matter if it's organic or non-organic. And if you want to eat fresher and better tasting fruits and vegetables, go and buy support your local small farm. They often produce varieties that you might not find in the grocery store, 
And that can make all the difference in the taste. The main message here is though, don't be afraid of conventional produced fruit and vegetables. They remain one of the most healthy thing you can put into your body, no matter if they're produced organically or not. Starting next week, we will promoting my book. We will do that with a sign up list, right? Please consider to sign up to the list. It's going to be free and anonymous, but it will give us a good idea for the demand of the book. The book is currently an editing process and we're designing the cover. So we're almost there. Thank you for all my subscribers. You guys have been a great blessing to me. And if you haven't subscribed, please do. I'll see you all next week. I'm out.